Welcome to Graber Works. Today's video is on our visit to Boston, Massachusetts, specifically the Quincy Market, Faneuil Hall, and the North End Harbor area. You'll find some great food choices, history, and some great views of the harbor and Boston skyline. In May 1823, the newly elected mayor Joshua Quincy was disgusted by the view from his office in Faneuil Hall. He noticed the chaos was caused by the fact that the 7,600 square foot market right underneath his office at the hall was no longer sufficient to cater for the need of the city. There were wooden sheds around the hall for more fish and produce market activities. Mayor Quincy formed a committee to find a solution to this, but he wasn't happy with the resolution. Instead, he led a new committee with new plans and substantial improvements around the area. On April 27, 1825, Merrick Quincy laid the cornerstone for this important market. The market house opened to the public on August 26, 1826. The two-story Greek Revival edifice of 535 feet in length and 50 feet in width allowed 128 fruit stalls on the ground floor and an exposition area on the second floor. Many Finnell Hall tenants relocated to the new market building till it gradually closed down. The market continued to serve Boston, but it had also reached its maximum capacity during the 1850s. Enlargement plans were proposed, including the addition of two more stories and widening the South and North markets so that they are similar to the Quincy Market in the middle. This was rejected in the end with the help of the city solicitor to retain Alexander Paris's original design. To solve the capacity problem, the ground floor of Fennell Hall had become a market once again in 1858. The North and South Market, however, desired enlargement in their structures too. As these buildings were privately held, the City Council was more tolerant and the property owners were exempted from certain deed restrictions, particularly about the height of buildings. This explained the different additions that happened in the late 19th century. By the mid-19th century, due to the expansion of the Boston's border, people tended to shop near their homes. Quincy Market was noticeably turned to wholesale. In fact, it got to the point when wholesaling became such dominant activity in the market that people believed it had a monopoly to the food supply of Boston, even though a study later revealed that the market was cheaper than local stalls, both in terms of wholesale and retail. After 189 years, Quincy Market still serves Boston with lots of good food, shopping, and being a good place for hanging out. For 275 years, Fennell Hall remains a site of meetings, protests, and debate right up to this very day. Because revolutionary era meetings and protests took place so frequently at the hall, successive generations continued to gather at the hall in their own struggles over the meaning and legacy of American liberty. Peter Fennell was the son of French Huguenot parents who immigrated to the colony of New York at the beginning of the 1700s. When his parents died, Peter came to live with his uncle Andrew Fennell in Boston. Andrew amassed a fortune as a merchant in town and evidently Peter became the favored nephew. When Andrew died in 1738, Peter inherited the majority of Andrew's estate and business. Virtually overnight, Peter Fennell became one of the wealthiest, if not the wealthiest, merchants in Boston. Beyond this complicated economic and social legacy, Peter sought to leave a personal legacy through a public gift. In 1740, Peter Fennell approached the town's government, the town meeting, with a proposal to establish a permanent central marketplace in the heart of Boston. Fennell himself would personally fund the construction of the building. Yet despite such a generous offer, the proposal provided to be a very contentious issue. Many opponents raised concern that by centralizing the market, sellers would raise prices and hurt competition. When it finally came to a vote, Fennell's proposal ultimately carried. It passed by a slim margin, 367 to 360. Almost as an afterthought, Peter Fennell decided to add a meeting hall over the market floor in the proposed building proposal. Construction completed in 1742. Fennell's hall quickly became an invaluable part of Boston's civic and social life. Indeed, when a fire gutted the interior of the building in 1761, the town leaders quickly put together a series of lotteries where the proceeds funded a reconstruction and rehabilitation of Peter Fennell's gift. The hall reopened in 1763. Its opening coincided with the end of the French and Indian War and the beginning of the controversial financial policies from the mother country of Great Britain. The Stamp Act of 1765, for example, directly taxed the British American colonists. 
Even though Bostonians had a direct voice in town affairs at the town meetings and chose the representative for Massachusetts legislature in annual votes at Fennell Hall, they had neither direct nor indirect voice in Britain's parliament. As such, many members supported political leaders such as James Otis and Samuel Adams, who led campaigns against the Stamp Act and taxation without representation. Yet, despite the rhetoric in places such as the Hall, official town meetings and government functions were generally limited to only those eligible to vote, property-owning men who were 21 or older. Nonetheless, as tensions of the revolutionary period grew more intense through the events of the Boston Massacre and the Boston Tea Party, the meetings in Fennell Hall began to transform into meetings of the body. Some of the most intense meetings, such as those leading up to the Boston Tea Party, so overwhelmed the capacity of the hall that the meetings had to be moved to the Old South Meeting House. By 1805, the town decided to expand the building. Undertaken by Boston architect Charles Bullfinch, the hall reopened in 1806 to the dimension it is now today. As Boston continues to grow in the 1800s, though, the direct voter system of a town meeting grew increasingly unwieldy. In 1822, a final town meeting approved a motion to recharter Boston as a city with the mayor and aldermen board. The city eventually established a separate city hall and moved offices and most of the functions out of Fennell Hall. Yet, because of its space and history, the city retained ownership of Fennell Hall as a public event and meeting space. In the 19th century, the hall's memory as the cradle of liberty of the revolution drew political and social activists, both locally and nationally, to continue what the founding generation started. Abolitionists, sufferers, labor unionists, and their respective opposition movements all had protests, conventions, banquets, and orientations in the Great Hall continuously in the 1800s. Despite political resistance and sometimes outright street violence, abolitionists began to rebrand the hall as a vital local and national stage for resisting the institution of slavery. Frederick Douglass, Wendell Phillips, William Lloyd Garrison, and countless other abolitionist orders spoke in the name of freedom. To this day, the hall remains a continuously used meeting place for political and civic events, a third century of American Revolution and beyond. While most accounts of history focus on Fennell Hall as the meeting place of the revolution, the hall served other vital civic functions as well. Indeed, Peter Fennell's initial vision of the hall was that of a central public marketplace. Though controversy surrounded the notion of centralized markets during the middle 1700s, by the early 1800s, most Bostonians recognized that innovation was vital for a rapidly growing city. Soon the demand outstripped Fennell Hall's capacity. In 1824, the city unveiled plans to expand the marketplace by building the new and much larger Quincy Market, flanked by the equally massive North and South Markets. To this day, the entire area comprises a festival marketplace collectively called Fennell Hall Marketplace. Roughly 20 million people pass through this marketplace every year. While the first floor of Fennell Hall was served as a market and the second floor served as the government hall, the top floor served as an armory for the town's protection. Boston had several militia companies, and many began storing their equipment in the attic of the Fennell Hall in the 1740s. When the hall was expanded in 1806, offices and a large assembly room on the top floor were specifically designed to permit the militia's companies to continue to organize, meet, and drill. Of these companies, which trained and met in Fennell Hall for generations, the ancient and honorable artillery company is the oldest and the only unit who still call the hall home.